could talk. Okay, um, it, uh, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Eric Guidos, who will be our colloquium speaker today. Uh, Eric is a professor of geobiology. Do we have any other professors of geobiology in the audience today? Um, at the University of Hawaii, where he's in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. Uh, he did his uh, bachelor's degree at Caltech, and then he went to MIT knowing what he wanted to do, which was uh, aero-astro engineering. But then he met somebody named Paul Schechter, who I believe pulled him out of class and said, you need to go to a telescope, son. <laughs> and uh, my understanding is he went to that telescope and uh, found something of interest there, um, spiritually and scientifically, and uh, then uh, pursued his uh, PhD at MIT. Uh, the field of exoplanets hadn't quite taken root yet. So his uh, PhD was actually an extragalactic work, but he slowly worked his way back to smaller scales and uh, found his home in exoplanets. And so, uh, you know, I, I really uh, think it's great to have Eric here. Uh, I, I've always admired, long before I met you, I admired uh, your um, productivity uh, for all the papers uh, on a wide range of topics um, related to stellar astrophysics and finding uh, exoplanets and uh, thinking about uh, conditions for habitability in astrobiology. And I really enjoy our, our conversations together. Um, Eric wanted me to make sure to thank the ITC for a really lovely visit he had a year or two ago, stayed for a couple months while he was on sabbatical. Uh, and he is currently a Fulbright Fellow uh, for this uh, three or four months at the, uh, at the University of Vienna. So he flew across the Atlantic to come visit us, and he's heading home um, tomorrow. All right, so uh, Eric, uh, come on up, please. Thanks, Dave, for that wonderful introduction. And um, thanks to all of you for coming today. And uh, again, thanks to uh, uh, SAO and CFA for hosting my uh, brief visit. Um, it's a full packed couple of days. Uh, it makes me wish I had more time uh, we all wish that. Uh, in fact, time is the subject of my talk today uh, on the subject of exoplanets. Uh, if you ask an astronomer what would they like for their birthday or any day of the year, they would probably tell you more time. And I don't think they're referring to this expensive watch, uh, by the way, which you can buy if you have a third of a million dollars. <laughs> it uh, is actually, this is a real watch. It actually has a uh, working orrery of the solar system uh, complete with 24 karat gold and uh, diamond studded version, I think is what's shown here. And each of the planets are represented by a uh, different uh, mineral which has been carved, uh, uh, not to scale as you can obviously see. But in fact, the Keplerian laws are obeyed here and these planets move on their correct time scales. So you have uh, the outer planet Saturn, I believe, uh, is the one that is the longest period in this watch, and they actually uh, obey the uh, the appropriate time scales. How do you tell the time? It's astronomical time. It's on the outer ring here. You can see that. Oh, it's, re it's real time. It's real. It's real planetary time. This is the one that counts, especially in this field. So um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, time from uh, not the perspective of not having enough time, particularly when you're writing telescope proposals, which many of us were doing last week, um, but time from the sense of something we would want in order to understand a physical process uh, or physical processes, uh, ones that are governing, in this case, the uh, evolution of planetary systems, of pl individual planets, and particularly planets that are uh, capable of supporting life or, or Earth-like. Um, and I'm going to give some vignettes from some work that uh, my collaborators and students and I have been doing over the past couple of years to try to contribute to this uh, in the context of a lot of other work that's going out there on this subject as well. 
Uh, so I do want to highlight uh, three people who have done a lot of the work which I'm going to show you today. Uh, Andrew Mann, who's currently a postdoc, a Hubble fellow at UT Austin. Megan Anstell, who's a graduate student finishing up uh, at the University of Hawaii and will be looking for a postdoc position next year. And Sam Grunblatt, who is just a couple years behind and is just starting his PhD thesis. And uh, in a few years, he also will be looking abroad, as we say, uh, from the University of Hawaii. Uh, so the idea is that uh, in our solar system, as our sort of model planetary system, we see uh, not only the evidence of events that were at the beginning, that is the, involved in the, in the initial stage of planet formation, as come from us, for example, for primitive materials, meteorites, uh, cosmic uh, grains in those meteorites, which tell us events on the order of a few million years, very critical information about the formation of planets. But the planets themselves, as planetary bodies, preserve uh, indications of significant events that happened many millions of years later. Uh, and I just give some examples. Between 50 and 100 million years after time zero in the solar system, we had a moon forming impact on the Earth. Uh, sometime in the inner solar system, the very inner solar system, the planet Mercury experienced some sort of major catastrophe, which led to having it a large iron to silicate ratio, uh, perhaps complete disruption and reassembly of the planet itself. We had uh, this very wonderful idea of the architecture of the outer solar system being, as we see it today, being the product of a major resonance crossing of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, sometime perhaps a few hundred million years after time zero, something that may be related to the impact history in the inner solar system. Uh, and then we have other major events that were occurring sort of on a more inexorable but maybe smaller scale. Uh, in the inner solar system, the atmospheres of the terrestrial planets evolved, uh, particularly uh, the Earth and Venus. Venus uh, going a very different way from Earth because of the, presumably, the, the higher level of Uranus that it exper experienced. Earth of the past was not the Earth of the present, and Venus may have been uh, in a similar state. So that's the solar system. Now, when we look at exoplanet science, and we are able now to see the bigger picture, of course, uh, one of the things that has come down to us is this astounding diversity uh, in the architectures of planetary systems and the properties of the individual planets. We know a lot more than we did when uh, I started my PhD and wanted to work on exoplanet science before there was so much known about them, if at all. And uh, the uh, you know, the, the kind of canonical plot that we put up these days to sort of impress all the people outside the field of how many discoveries we have usually has these plots have two dimensions. Most of these plots do. And we can pick something like orbital period and planet radius to show the distributions. Of course, many of these planets are in the same system, so this is just the net aggregate of those. And this impresses you, or is supposed to impress you, with the diversity of both the sizes of the orbital periods. And then I can show you pictures of the geometries of the systems, many of which are much more compact than the, our planetary system. Of course, uh, there are many other dimensions which are less well explored. Uh, one of those, for example, being planet mass. It's much more difficult in many cases to measure the mass of the planet than the radius, thanks to uh, Kepler being so capable of uh, measuring the, the latter. Um, but there's one dimension here that's extremely important, and that is the dimension of time. And that's sort of the, something that I would like to explore a little bit today. So what we see are, is an amazing diversity of planetary systems and planets. And the diversity, most of that diversity is probably already still hidden to us. We don't know, for example, the compositions of a lot of the atmospheres, or most of the atmospheres. What's that island floating up on the high side? Up here. Yeah, yeah those are the Jupiter uh, size planets. <laughs> So this is a log scale. So um, this is 10 to the 0, which is 1. And uh, those are planets that are basically the size of Jupiter. These are the Earth size and super Earth and Neptune real, size planets. Is it real or is it observational uh, There are observational biases in this plot. Um, but of course, uh, there is uh, a tendency for planets uh, that are a mass of between, say, Saturn and a few Jupiter's masses to all have approximately the same uh, radius because of the 
the internal uh, equations of state, which are controlled mostly by the degeneracy pressures, the electron degeneracy. So it's partly real. So there's a real tendency for planets about the mass of Jupiter to be about the size of Jupiter. And, and there are selection effects that take uh, hold here when you're looking at, say, farther from the star or at very small radii where these planets are very hard to detect. So the structure, the exact structure, is a function not only of the natural diversity out there, but our ability to observe it. So you do have this amazing diversity. This is the number one lesson of exoplanet science that I think has come home to us. We see planets now in diverse environments. We see planets around many different stars, uh, different spectral types, masses. Uh, we see star planets in different environments, as I'll show you a little bit of. Uh, we uh, uh, see uh, planets uh, around uh, binary stars, or single stars, or even triple stars. And uh, we can infer something, perhaps, that uh, took place to produce this outcome. Environments acting with something else, stochastic processes, that uh, produce at diverse planets or diverse evolutionary out histories. So as Dave mentioned, I'm a professor of geobiology. It's, I think, easier to say than to explain, but we are concerned as geobiologists with the evolution of life on the Earth and the interaction with the inorganic world. So how did the interplay between living things and non-living aspects of the Earth operate over evolutionary time to produce the Earth now, but also at present epochs. So I teach a class in basic Earth history, Geology 101, literally. And uh, I talk a lot about Darwin and how Darwin came about to make his rather um, amazing inferences that he did. He built on the work of others, but he made leaps forward um, that were a product of his observations of the environment. And I like to make this connection with exoplanets because exoplanets kind of just reminds me in a way of some aspects of maybe where uh, biological sciences was um, some, time, some time ago. Uh, and planets, like living things, are not necessarily subject to reduction in the simple way, say, that particles are. Uh, so they're, they're a tougher nut to crack. And a lot of them has to do with the fact that they, the, the diversity probably depends on their histories, like the history of life. So Darwin was able to figure things out uh, because he made this trip around the world in the Beagle, of course, and he uh, observed diversity, say so diversity of finches on the Galapagos Islands. Um, and he, uh, of course, knew about fossils. Uh, the natural scientists of the day knew that these were you know, past life forms that lived on the Earth. Uh, the relationship between those fossils and the present was a matter of some debate, but they were clearly living things. So he knew that there was life at times and that, li that life was different. Um, but uh, what really sort of jarred his thinking and made him think about things was being able to observe ongoing processes and be able to link ongoing processes with past events and in order to explain what the, what the diversity of life, the finches, the, the tortoises of the Galapagos were at the present time. So we face sort of a similar challenge that Darwin had, uh, and we have to make sort of similar conceptual leaps perhaps sometimes because we don't have all the access to everything that's going on or to prior times. But in some ways we have it easier than Darwin because we do, unlike Darwin, have access to those earlier times, at least in analog form. We can look at star systems uh, and their planetary systems that are uh, much younger than our uh, sun, and thus represent stages presumably to which the planetary systems, uh, as a population at least, that we observe now have passed. And so we can see uh, past events. We can see those earlier life forms, so to speak. So unlike Darwin, who can, and unlike us, who could never look at a, a living dinosaur, except for the birds, I suppose, uh, we can look at past forms of planetary systems. We have our own real Jurassic Park out there. So uh, this is the Pleiades. This is one of many clusters of stars, uh, which you should be able to start to see in the night sky um, and uh, at the present time. And they're about 125 million years old. The 
the exact age is a matter of some debate. So uh, in principle, we think there are planetary systems around uh, these stars. There should be. And it's, and it's a matter of just finding these planetary systems, studying them, and then comparing them. Now, that's easier said than done, uh, even with Kepler, as I'll point out in a moment. But it is, it is uh, a resource that the natural world has provided us. So uh, we can observe in the ga galaxy populations of stars with different ages. And Kepler can observe these too, Kepler, the transit planet finding mission. So the original Kepler mission, which lasted about four and a half year, uh, uh, years, was observing a spot in the sky which was not selected necessarily to uh, maximize this kind of science, observing planetary systems at different stages of evolution. It was a field that was selected based on a balance between maximizing the number of planetary systems that could be observed or planets that could be observed and also minimizing the the technical problems of observing those planets in crowded fields of stars. Uh, but there were clusters in the Kepler field. Uh, uh, there's at least four. There are uh, clusters in the Kepler field. Uh, and uh, this is just listed here. And uh, there are uh, at least a couple of known planets around those clusters. Uh, so Soren, who's here, uh, was responsible for leading the work on on two of these discoveries and basically uh, found planets that are not too atypical from the kind of planets we found around uh, uh, older stars. So if you look up here, you can see the uh, ages and the distance of these, of these clusters. And I seem to have permuted these, these two numbers. I apologize. But uh, uh, I hope you're convinced that uh, a lot of these are fairly far away compared to uh, stars that are readily observable or that can be easily studied of a few tons of parsecs. Um, and uh, they are uh, typically older. So it's true that we can sample ages here uh, back to, uh, say, 800 million years. But a lot of the events on the early solar system we know took place before that time. And so we would like to observe even younger clusters. And most importantly, we would like to observe younger or near, more nearby clusters, more nearby star systems that are more readily uh, discovered. Um, I don't want to say fortunately, but it happened that Kepler's uh, reaction wheel, th one, uh, two of Kepler's reaction wheels failed, and thus the mission had to be repurposed into something called K2. I'm sure many of you, if not al almost all of you, are familiar with this uh, story and the fact that the Kepler was reborn as the K2 mission to observe uh, not the Kepler field, but the uh, fields along the ecliptic plane. And that took advantage of using the sun as basically a stabilizing force on the, on the spacecraft. Uh, because it was able to observe uh, all these different fields, in fact, it has to move every three months, uh, then uh, there is the possibility of observing more diverse uh, stellar systems, which could include younger clusters of stars uh, and more nearby. So this is just a simple plot showing the locations of present, past, <clears throat> and uh, future fields by the K2 uh, mission. And on it, I plotted here, there's the galactic plane, which is the solid, the black dotted line. And then the uh, locations of some of the uh, uh, nearby clusters of stars with established ages, uh, which are color coded by their age, red being old and purple being uh, uh, younger. So you can see there's a range of these, some of which fortuitously fall in or near the K2 fields. So you can see down here, for example, upper Scorpius in the row of Fucus. Star formation region uh, is partly covered by um, one of the K2 fields. In fact, a, a second one is coming up. Uh, Taurus will also be observed. Precipi, um, and then the Hyades here, uh, very nearby uh, star system, which is roughly 650 million years. So you have now the ability to observe stellar systems and their planetary systems, presumably at a range of ages, and start to put together this picture, perhaps, of planetary evolution, uh, both at the system level and then perhaps of uh, individual planets. And I've just sort of superposed a few of these clusters on the time scale for Earth and solar system history to kind of give you a feel for the sampling. This is plotted on a, plotted on a log scale here, in part, 
because a lot of interesting stuff is happening in a very short interval early on the solar system, uh, and then things become a little bit quieter out on the Giga range. Uh, so here you have Taurus at uh, one to three million years in terms of the ages of the stars. Upper Scorpius comes in around 10 million, maybe 11 million years. These ages are not precisely known, and most of them are very model dependent. Uh, the Pleiades, as I mentioned, is at about 125. The Hyades at 600 or 700 million years. Uh, and of course, there are others that you could plot on here. And you can sort of see some of the interesting uh, history, which by analogy might be occurring around those other planetary systems, which you can observe sort of live, like the live feed here on YouTube. So uh, Taurus might capture uh, the, uh, the actual epoch of planet formation, uh, upper Scorpius perhaps the last stages, the giant impact phase when objects like the moon would have formed. By the time you get to the Pleiades, probably that, that phase is uh, mostly or almost all completed, and then you're expecting sort of the cleanup of the leftovers from the planetary lunch. Uh, and then high age is out here where you would tend to see more of those processes by which um, planets have evolved slowly over time, such as the atmospheric evolution. But again, remember that the evolution that I am talking about is based almost entirely on our understanding of the solar system. And so like the diversity of planetary systems, the diversity of evolutionary histories might be much wider. And so everything I said is basically just a small subset, might be a small subset of what all the, the events that may happen around other stars. Oh, and then, of course, as you look up here, you can see, in fact, um, we are finding, or K2 is finding, and the people working with or on the K2 project are finding planets via the transit detection method uh, around some of these stars. So they exist, and they can be studied, and some of them readily so. So here's a, just a few vignettes. Um, this is K225b. So it's a um, member of the, uh, it orbits around a star in the, uh, in the Hyades. This is an M dwarf, one of my favorite types of stars. Also, uh, Professor Charbonneau's favorite type of star as well. Um, and this M dwarf is known to be between 600 and 700 million years based on the age of the cluster. Uh, there's some pr uh, properties of the star down here. This is a, Super Earth, maybe mini Neptune sized star that doesn't say, doesn't mean it is Earth like or Neptune like. That's basically the size range. Um, and its transit uh, is superposed on everything else that's happening for the star. So the star is rotating, it is rotating more rapidly uh, with a period of a few days, and it is more active than, of course, older stars. And as a result of that, its light curve is varying strongly. And so it, there is some challenge in actually detecting these signals compared to, say, the uh, signals of more cooperative, more quiescent stars. But they are there. And people like Andrew Vandenberg, who is a graduate student here, as you, I'm sure you know him, um, has spent a lot of work uh, and, and is actively working on uh, doing the careful subtraction of the noise and the stellar signals in order to isolate those small signals of the planets. Uh, so that's a, definitely a member of the Hyades. This is another one that came up in our search. This is a member of the uh, Pleiades system, not. Uh, this was a planet that was detected around a uh, Pleiades candidate based on the uh, distance of the star and the proper motion and space motions of the star. Uh, people who do this work very authoritatively said with a 99% probability this is a member of the Pleiades. Um, and then on later investigation, it turned out perhaps not to be so, so true. But just, this is not a criticism of that work. This means just that you can't uh, rest on your laurels and you have to verify. Trust but verify, or don't trust and verify. This planet's a little bit smaller. It orbits a, uh, a little bit further away from the star with a, a radius of a, uh, about twice that of the Earth. Uh, I should say this is no longer submitted, it's accepted. Uh, the, the star is uh, rotating, but its rotation period is 20 days. That is not typical of the Pleiades. Uh, it's quite variable, so it's definitely spotted. But there are other things that distinguish it from the Pleiades. It's moving with the same motions of the Pleiades, almost 
identical, which is why we thought it was a member. But if you look at the distance between the star and the Pleiades, it's outside the tidal radius of the Pleiades. It cannot have, uh, it's, it's not bound to the Pleiades. Uh, and its motion with respect to the Pleiades is such that it's not simply traveling away from the Pleiades on some slow pace, it seems. Um, it's also metal rich, uh, which the Pleiades is not so much. So that also uh, distinguishes it from the Pleiades. Uh, it's active and has an ultraviolet emission, which is suggestive of a young age, but it doesn't have lithium. Uh, and we were ready to use that as a, a reason to throw it out. But then we realized, based on some excellent work uh, by uh, Mark Pinsano's uh, group, that um, uh, that uh, lithium depletion is strongly metallicity dependent. So lithium is a great age indicator because it's burned uh, rather quickly on the time scale of tens or hundreds of millions of years, particularly in low mass stars. Um, but that uh, is metallicity dependent. And for metal rich stars, it turns out um, that, that the depletion is, is much more rapid. And as a result, uh, we expect uh, no lithium in a star of this metallicity for even a Pleiades age. Uh, but our current, our current understanding of the system is that probably it is not a Pleiades age star. It's young, perhaps a billion years old, but it doesn't fit. So in fact, at this date, and maybe somebody will prove me wrong tomorrow, we know of no planets orbiting Pleiades stars. And then the question is, why aren't they there? Kepler has observed these. K2 has observed these. And we can do some simple calculations by putting a simulated planet population around observed Pleiades stars. We can assume, for example, that the same planet population that we find in the Kepler field, that we found in the Kepler field, is orbiting the Pleiades stars. And if we do that, we find, on average, one or two planets in our simulations, which means that the probability of finding no planets is not insignificant. And so that may be the simplest explanation. Uh, this is going to depend on knowing a little bit more precisely the properties of the Pleiades stars in order to make that calculation uh, somewhat more accurate or robust. Uh, this is just a plot of the rotation period of the star here, which turns out to be about 20 days, compared to its color, which is an indicator of temperature, of course. And the Pleiades members, which are rather robustly determined, uh, color-coded here according to the probability of membership, the red ones here, are either uh, very fast rotating, uh, less than a day, or rather slow rotating, um, but all basically less than 10 days, or no more than 10 days. This is a 20-day outlier. And we can also try to use models. This is sort of a, a, a somewhat less robust uh, indication of age. But we can compare the properties, assuming that we know the distance to the, to the star based on its photometry. And also uh, 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 try to um, constrain uh, the age of the star based on a comparison with the model predictive properties. That's what this cluster of points here. And the interesting uh, result, which again is model dependent, is that these suggest, in fact, that this could be quite young, but it also could be quite old. This doesn't show up, unfortunately, too much in this plot, but there's actually a locus that extends out here to even a, a, a over a giga year. So unfortunately, this isn't a smoking gun that says either way, um, but the consensus is it's probably not a uh, member of the Pleiades. So we've uh, most recently uh, submitted a paper um, on another cluster, which is perhaps about the same age as the Hyades, maybe a little bit older, Precipe of the Beehive. And uh, we've found uh, six or seven. Uh, we're unable to completely confirm all of them. Six or seven planets around Precipe stars. So this is a, a sample that is a, uh, of comparable size to the Pleiades. Uh, in terms of number of stars, uh, and it is uh, giving us uh, far more planets uh, than the Pleiades, so to speak, uh, say the least. And uh, one probable reason is that the stars are 
uh, more cooperative. Uh, they are older, uh, less active, less rapidly rotating, um, and they have better behaved light curves, and it's easier to find transiting planets in those. Also, the stars for the M dwarfs particularly have all arrived on the main sequence, and so they're about as small as they can get. And smaller stars, as Professor Charbonneau has probably told you many times, are great places to find transiting planet because the amount of light that's occulted by the planet is more, and so you get a bigger transit signal. So Precipi is easier in, that, in those two respects, and we find new planets, and now we can sort of start to add up. Uh, we're not quite at the large number of statistics yet in terms of our discoveries, but there's some interesting trends that have started to emerge. One of them is just the radius of these planets. So there was a question about the distribution and the structure of the of the exoplanet population as a whole. And you remember there was a little clump and there was a big clump. And the big clump has almost all the planets. So all the planets that we're detecting to a sort of 95% level are between the size of the Earth and the size of a couple Earth or three Earth radii. Uh, so if you just restrict yourself to the M-dwarfs, that's what you see here. So this is the black points on this plot are Kepler planets, that is in the original Kepler field. And the colored points are ones that have been discovered around these young clusters. So uh, you can see that uh, sort of invariant of the host star mask, and we're focusing on the M dwarfs here and a little bit into the K dwarfs, that uh, these planets are all small. But when we look at these younger systems, we seem to be finding, possibly, an inordinate number of larger planets in terms of radius. Not necessarily more massive. We don't have masses for these but uh, larger in terms of radius up here. Uh, and this is showing versus irradiance as well. It's not completely as firm in terms of the plot versus irradiance, but in terms of stellar mass, it seems pretty clear that a lot of these young clusters host uh, larger numbers of, of larger planets. Now, there's an ob observational bias here because it's harder to find planets around larger stars and more active stars of course, the planets you're going to find are, tend to be larger. Those are the ones that can be detected. The smallest planets probably aren't observable. But if you do the simple math, we shouldn't be finding that many of these compared to, say, ones that are slightly smaller. We should be finding a lot of these and not so many of these, but perhaps not so many of the small sort of Earth-sized ones in the open clusters. What we seem to be finding is mostly the big ones with a few small ones. And uh, there may be possible explanations for that uh, in terms of just the history of the planets. So uh, many of these planets which are not Earth size, and definitely ones that are, say, twice the size of the Earth or bigger, uh, are probably, and so for some of them we know for sure, based on mass measurements, surrounded by envelopes of low molecular weight material. It may be a contribution from ices and water, uh, but there's also a significant contribution from hydrogen helium. These things must have hydrogen helium envelopes that for a small amount of mass can produce a fairly large radius. That hydrogen helium envelope is subject to basically two effects. One is because of its lower molecular weight escape, and the other thing is that it will can thermally contract. Uh, it can get rid of it, basically shed entropy by radiation, uh, the initial radiation, for example, of accretion. And there has been a lot of people and a lot of groups working on studying or modeling the evolution of planets like this over time uh, for various initial radii, for various masses, and for various scenarios for efficiency of the escape of those atmospheres, in addition to just the pure contraction which will occur over time. That's basically represented by the blue line here. So you can see, according to the models at least, that in the first sort of 100 million years or so, maybe a giga year, that you can get significant contraction of these planets. This is the prediction. So perhaps by going back to the uh, age of the precipice or younger systems, we are actually now uncovering these bloated planets that are still cooling and contracting. Now the precipice planets are out here, where at least the models say that pretty much everything is over. But the models at the moment may not be absolutely correct. Uh, so we will have to see. And one big uh, avenue, of course, is to actually make measurements of the mass of these objects so we can put them on the scale. And we can go further back in time now. 
Uh, this is a planet uh, that has been found by two groups. One is uh, the group, uh, my group, uh, the work led by Andrew Mann at, at Texas. Uh, another one is a group at uh, Cal basic or centered at Caltech. We basically simultaneously found these object and published it. It's in upper Scorpius. It's 10 million years old. Uh, this is the light curve here. So you see the strong rotational variability that is due to the spottedness of the star. And after you uh, cleverly uh, uh, remove some of that, thanks to some of the uh, work by Andrew Vandenberg here, uh, you can actually see these are the transits, very obvious here, of this object. So this is somewhat bigger now. It's a five Earth radii. It has a period which is actually not too different from that of the star. Uh, so it's very close to the stellar rotation of six days. And maybe this is telling us something about the interaction uh, between the star, uh, the planet, and the disk which was there, for sure. There may be a disk there. There's a tentative detection by Spitzer of some infrared excess, but it, there's no WISE, um, that's an infrared satellite, uh, excess, and so it's unclear. This is a good object, perhaps, for follow-up to look to see if there's a disk. But many stars of this age in Upper Scorpius have disks, so it wouldn't be surprising that there's still something there. Uh, but now we're basically probing at the very end, or in, even in the middle, of planet formation itself. Uh, and we can start to scale, uh, sorry, we can start to compare these to uh, models of the um, uh, evolution of these planets. So I showed you some simple, uh, well, I shouldn't say simple, but uh, say restricted models of simulation of individual planets. And a leap beyond that is actually to simulate entire planet populations. Uh, so this is uh, the Baron groups. The Baron Switzerland has a group that does these planet population synthesis models. And this is basically a plot showing evolutionary tracks in the, rel in the populations that may evolve from uh, those uh, evolutionary tracks and in initial conditions at, uh, say, 10 or 11 million years, which is about the age of the upper Scorpius system. So we can sort of zoom in on, the, on these uh, model populations. This is all, these are all fake planets produced by these models. And we can look for planets that are uh, simulated planets that have the observed properties of um, K233b. And as a result of that, we can see whether or not these models are producing planets that are consistent with that. You can see there are dots in here, so this is true. And we can actually make model-dependent predictions of what the mass of this object would be. Um, so the predicted masses of this object, according to the models, are 5 to 12 Earth masses. So this object is not a Jupiter or Saturn. It's really a very swollen Earth-sized planet, if the models are correct. And we can't measure that quite yet. Um, but with a little work with infrared spectrographs that are, again, less sensitive to the vagaries of young stars, perhaps, this is definitely doable at the sort of few meters per second. Uh, if it turns out to be a very different object, then, a clear, then clearly the models uh, have to be uh, addressed. The deficiency in the models have to be addressed. But on a bigger scale, at least, this model predicts that size, or that mass of a planet. It also, we know uh, that uh, from the model prediction is that the planet has already cooled enough that it's no longer self-luminous. So there is some hope, perhaps, that this very young, fairly large planet might be actually detected in the direct infrared emission that you might see as it passes behind the star and is eclipsed by it. Uh, that may come to be, but the model prediction right now is that you won't see anything. It's too cool already. But again, the models might be wrong. And then there are other things. So now, going to 10 million years and going back, a uh, little more than that, to say three million years or even earlier, we are now entering the, uh, the realm of planet formation where there are still primordial disks that are producing things, including planets, presumably. And this is now making, uh, 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 putting K2 and other transit planet finding missions in a position to make sort of unique and perhaps unexpected contributions to our understanding of planet evolution. Kepler was designed to find Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars, and then it's finding a whole bunch of other stuff. 
Uh, but some of these things I don't think were perhaps imagined when Kepler was on the drawing board, although they would be found by other uh, space-based telescope missions uh, even before Kepler flew. So uh, these are what we call, for lack of a better term, dipper stars. Uh, they are a collection of low-mass, say, K and M dwarfs in very young clusters or star-forming regions like uh, Rho Fucus or Upper Scorpius, and they exhibit very bizarre light curves. These are not transits of planets. They have the wrong shape, the wrong duration, and they are episodic. Most of them are not periodic, though there's a few, a couple, that have some strong period, periodic-like signals. So this is just a comparison of blow-ups of these dips to convince you that compared to planets, they don't have the right shape. And then here, you can see the, the depth of these dips. Before, we were talking about a small fraction of a percent or even hundreds of parts per million for the planet. This is uh, tens of percent decreases in the intensity of the light curves. Now, those of you who work on uh, uh, Titari stars, young stars, will know some of these phenomena already. There is a class of phenomena known for intermediate mass stars called the Ux Orionis, or Uxor uh, variations. These potentially are related to these. These might be the low mass equivalent of those. And how these are, how this phenomena uh, comes to be, the mechanism, this is not known. The uh, ideas are usually centered around the disk itself or some parts or structures of the disk or products of the disk that are occulting parts of the star. And the um, uh, dust in that disk or these clumps of planetesimals are blocking large amounts of the starlight. Uh, on sort of episodic time scales. Um, and uh, the, all we have to go on right now is the fact that uh, every one of these stars for which we know this phenomena has the uh, unambiguous infrared signature of a disk around it, that it's fairly close in. Um, but other than that, we really don't know right now, and this is a subject of, of, of active research. Uh, this is actually one of the sort of a smoking gun that a, di a disk is involved somehow. This is the infrared excess here, showing how much material is emitting light besides the photosphere. This is the depth of the dip, and there is a significant correlation between the depth of the dip and the infrared excess. Whether or not this is a physical effect or a geometric effect is not known. The easiest explanation would be simply that we are observing some disks nearly edge on in some structures that are popping up out of the disk midplane are obscuring our, the our line of sight to the star periodically or episodically. Therefore, it's more likely if the disk is almost edge on, but not quite on edge on, that we would be seeing this. And the prediction is that the dipper stars should have disks that are almost edge on. So Megan Ansdell has been doing some work uh, with ALMA. Her thesis is based mostly on ALMA data. That's the submillimeter observatory in Chile, which is able to observe disks at sort of sub-arc second at sub-millimeter, millimeter wavelengths where the disk is relatively optically thin. You can basically see right through it, but you can also see all of it. And uh, the sensitivity is that you can see these disks and spatially resolve them enough that you can measure their inclinations with respect to our line of sight. The expectation and prediction is when we look at dippers, they should be edge on. That expectation is wrong. And the, uh, essentially, uh, none of the three that we looked at were close to edge on. They were seemed to be drawn from random uh, angles. Of course, that's only a sample of three, but it strongly indicated that something else is going on there. Either the disks are only indirectly involved in the dipping phenomena, or there's an inner disk which is inclined with respect to the disk that Alma can see. And so we're planning to follow this up with more observations at visible wavelengths where we can get even closer to see the disk closer in and polarize uh, scattered light. So we, uh, this morning, um, I had the pleasure of sitting in on another we uh, WebEx meeting for the TESS mission. Uh, the, uh, TESS is a, probably a mission I don't have to talk much about. It gets, since people uh, such as Dave and Dave and Dave are both uh, heavily involved in leading that. Uh, as well as the group at MIT. 
Uh, this is a mission, again, to find transiting planets around other stars, brighter stars this time. Um, but it also represents an opportunity to um, uh, probe, again, this dimension of time. So uh, at that WebEx meeting, there was a presentation by Soren Maibaum, who is leading an effort to try to get interest in young clusters of stars to be observed by tests, uh, moving groups, any sort of stars which may not have a, the typical age uh, characteristic age of the stars that we might look at if we were only concerned about finding as many planets as possible. But these young stars may tell us much more. They give us that leverage for time. So uh, in the era now of TESS, which will be launched in a year or so, and Gaia, which has been launched and will provide us and is providing us these uh, precise astrometric measurements of stars, we should start thinking about, or people should start thinking about, how to identify the stars that we want to observe next in order to now add to what uh, K2 has seen. Um, one way you can do this is basically by, uh, for the M-dwarfs at least, take, the fact, take into account the fact that uh, M-dwarfs that are very young, say less than a couple hundred million years or 300 million years, are still not quite on the main sequence. And they're still evolving down to the main sequence. And therefore, they're overluminous with respect to the main sequence, the zero age main sequence. And so with parallaxes from Gaia, and with a effective temperature from spectroscopy or a good color, you can look for these things. Of course, you have to uh, distinguish them from metal-rich objects and from uh, stars that might be multiples, and thus are seen two stars that appear to be one. But the, there are possible ways to do this very systematically and efficiently. Uh, this is actually Gaia data, giving you absolute K magnitudes or luminosities uh, from their data release, which just happened a couple weeks ago of M dwarfs in a sample of stars uh, that we did as part of uh, our work out in Hawaii. And uh, you can see this dispersion, some of which is probably due to age, some of which is due to metallicity, and some of which is due to multiplicity. Uh, superposed on this are red stars among those for which we know they're active, that have uh, H alpha in emission, and this is another possible indicator of age. And a lot of these ones are lying up on the upper line. And perhaps even more compelling that this is leading somewhere are members of these young moving groups in the most nearby clusters, which we know which are young, which are lying also above here. That doesn't mean that some of them are not multiples, and so they're getting even boosted up higher. Um, but this is sort of a, a test to the proof of concept that using Gaia, as well as a clever application of the ground-based catalogs that have been produced, uh, we can identify young M dwarfs that even are not members of clusters, that are lone, lone M dwarfs that are out there, uh, but are perhaps incredibly nearby and therefore worthy of study. Uh, Kepler K2 are also giving us another benefit, which the stellar astronomers and astrophysicists love, uh, which is rotation. So with the ability to monitor stars continuously for tens of days, you can give you rotation periods out to those tens of days. And so we can actually uh, get very precise loci of rotation period versus sort of stellar mass, temperature, color, if you will, uh, and be able then to put a picture together of the change in rotation as the star spins down over time, the gyrochronology. And if we're observing a star and looking for planets, we will also get as a product of that the rotation period. So maybe not a selection, but a, after a, a posteriori estimate of age can be done perhaps fairly accurately to within, say, 10 or 15 percent of the age of the star. Then there's, of course, uh, astroseismology. Um, but astroseismology is challenged for the very youngest stars. So it remains to be seen whether stars significantly younger than a giga year, uh, we can make much progress, particularly the lower mass stars. K2 will observe uh, probably a couple more fields of interest, uh, upper uh, Scorpius and Rhoafucus in the future, uh, Taurus. Uh, this won't overlap with the previous field, so this is more of the upper Scorpius. Uh, and then uh, we just heard that campaign 16 will include more precipice stars. Uh, beyond that, we think probably, I think the estimates now that K2 will finally give up the ghost, or give up the gas, because it's uh, basically running out of steam. Uh, very quickly, in the last couple of minutes, uh, I want to now turn the clock forward. 
So uh, uh, a student at the University of Hawaii, Sam Grunblatt, has been working with me and with Dan Huber, an astroseismologist, on not very young stars, but on very old stars. We can ask the question about the future of planetary systems and where they will go in the future as the star continues to evolve and eventually leave the main sequence. And uh, what we've uh, been working on is to identify a giant planet that is orbiting a star which has moved off the main sequence. And this giant planet is being irradiated heavily because of the high luminosity of its, of its, uh, of its red giant uh, branch star. Uh, high, heavy, high irradiation has been correlated with inflation of giant planets. Statistically, it's an empirical fact that planets that are highly irradiated are much more likely to be inflated with respect to the prediction of a so one Jupiter radius, which I mentioned. So what I said was not completely true. Most planets around the mass of a Jupiter are the radius of a Jupiter. But if a planet is highly irradiated, it can swell up. And the question is basically whether that uh, mechanism is a result of the irradiation directly being deposited into the planet, or whether there's something involving the delayed cooling of the planet that is keeping it inflated and never had a chance to shrink down to, say, about one Jupiter radius. Eric Lopez uh, proposed that uh, evolving stars that have moved off the main sequence are a way to test and discriminate between those two scenarios. Because a giant planet that uh, when should not have been inflated on it when the star was on the main sequence and then becomes inflated when the star moves off the main sequence would be considered evidence for the energy being deposited into the planet, and that is the mechanism of the inflation. And we may have found such a planet. We basically find a planet that has an, uh, a model predicted irradiation that is sort of right at the irradiation threshold or even below it, um, but currently is well above it. And when we look at the estimate of the giant planet radius, it is significantly above the, the threshold sort of where you consider, consider the planet to be uh, irradiated. Therefore, it can't be explained by basically cooled uh, standard uh, giant planet models. Uh, and we can even estimate, again, as a model, somewhat model dependent, based on the uh, evolution of the star, taking it backwards in time, how much energy had to be deposited into the planet in order to explain its current inflation. And that turns out to be a fraction of a percent, which kind of fortunately for the theorists is pretty much what they've been assuming uh, previously. Uh, I mentioned this. This is basically the uh, identification of uh, uh, young dwarfs uh, by Gaia, uh, based again on the overluminosity above the main sequence, uh, beyond TESS and uh, beyond uh, the Gaia uh, catalog. Uh, in the in sort of intermediate future, where there are other transiting planet missions. Uh, I am based in Europe now, and so I get to hear a lot about the European side of exoplanet science, which is going very well. Uh, there is a mission called PLATO, which will observe multiple fields, uh, two of those fields for a very long duration, a couple of years, maybe three years, and then some fields at shorter duration. PLATO's mission is to find Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars and many other planets as well, particularly bright stars or planets with bright stellar hosts that, for which you can do astro-seismology. Um, but uh, uh, it could also do many other things to contribute to this picture of evolution of planets over time. Uh, and one possible uh, thing that it might do is basically observe for a long time, longer than K2 could do, K2 is limited to 80 days, but for two to three years, young stellar systems to observe the kind of variability, uh, both planetary and related to disks, and also astrophysical. Uh, by observing fields for which, which include young stellar clusters as well as basically stars close to the galactic plane and, and therefore younger. So I think that, uh, having this time perspective allows you to address many of the questions uh, uh, that concern us in planetary science and exoplanetary science are sort of, I have my three favorite big ones. You can add your own if you wish. Um, what are the major steps in planet formation and evolution? So I have given you examples from the solar system. That need not be, a, and probably isn't, a complete set. What are the pathways to planetary diversity? 
This is a much more complicated question, not just events, but actually pathways. And then something which kind of, I think, draws from that, which is, I think, an astrobiological interest, which was mentioned in my introduction. So the typical planet, we already sort of know this from Kepler, the typical planet, and perhaps the typical habitable planet, planet in the habitable zone, is not around a G dwarf, but around an M dwarf. There are more M dwarfs by far out there. And at least based on the close-in planets that we can see with Kepler, there are far more planets around M dwarfs than there are around solar type stars by a factor of four or five. You put those numbers together, and M dwarfs is the typical planet out there. So are these Earth-like planets? There are Earth-sized planets around M dwarfs for sure, but are they Earth-like or even habitable? And I think that is where uh, you want to start to understand not just what you see at the present time, planets being there, but also their histories, because that may, like each of us as people, our histories dictate a lot of what we do and why we are here uh, today. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Uh, questions for Eric or Sam? I was intrigued by your comparison with the population synthesis model. Now, clearly we're just learning a lot, and population synthesis is a very difficult enterprise, especially with a new class of object like this. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what goes into the model. Yeah, so it's a fairly standard model of um, uh, you have an evolving disk which is acting under the evolution of uh, internal disk processes like the dissipation of angular momentum or just redistribution of angular momentum within the disk, dissipation of energy, and then a dissipation of the disk mass under the influence of the star. In those disks there are um, planetary embryos that are given some initial distribution and those are allowed to accrete each other and also accrete planetesimals which is sort of the residual disk mass. Those those uh, cores, those rocky cores, that can then accrete gas from the nebula, which uh, for, under some conditions can lead to runaway growth of planets to go to a Jupiter size, but in others will simply stop at sort of the super the Neptune size where there's a significant but not dominating mass of gas in an envelope around these planets. And uh, there are many parameters that go into these models, and I am, I share your um, interest and skepticism both and I think in, in sort of how robust the results are but one thing they can sort of explore is uh, uh, what, which parameters might be important for controlling these so uh, one thing that turns out to be extremely important in the outcome of planetary systems for these models at least is the disk lifetime, the dissipation life, time scale, the disk which we don't know very precisely around stars, but which, in principle, we can measure. We can see this process. Uh, and this controls basically whether or not you get Neptunes, uh, whether you get Jupiters, and also I should add, I'm sorry if I left this out, migration, of course. This is also accounted for in, the, in these models. Um, so you can begin to test these models at a sort of uh, uh, stress them in ways that I think are really um, important, particularly at young ages. Because you can see the early stages where the models may be starting down the wrong road, for example, already, or are on the right track. Oh, I love them. Did you, you, you peeked at my last slide, which I didn't show. Or may, I did actually show this at the noon ITC talk, but under a different context, very different. Uh, so, one big thing about the um, M dwarf uh, difference, be, the difference between M dwarfs and G dwarfs is, uh, as I briefly mentioned, the time scale in which they evolve to the main sequence. So they can take, uh, for, for example, a quarter solar mass, they can take about 200 million years rather than a few million years uh, for a G dwarf. And thus, 
planets which have migrated in and which have formed on that time scale, remember by 200 million years the disk is gone, uh, are being exposed to irradiances, bolometric irradiances, which are far higher than what they uh, uh, experience today. So when we say a planet is in the habitable zone of an M-dwarf, it's very likely, especially if it's close in, that for the first 200 million years it experienced a very different condition. And uh, so, for example, uh, Luger and Barnes, Luger and Barnes uh, had a paper where they, um, uh, they proposed that uh, these plants would experience runaway greenhouses, where water vapor would go into the atmosphere and basically make uh, very inhospitable conditions, at least for a while, uh, while the planet was being heavily irradiated. And there may be other effects, too, in terms of the complete loss of all tile envelopes at those early phases. So that is one big difference between M dwarfs and G dwarfs. Whether well, that's the only significant, only difference that is in the county that it, you know, we don't know yet. But that's a good place to start. Yeah, I had a question about the, uh, the, I guess the dipper stars that you talked about and how you were expecting the disks to be more or less edge on to explain the large dips and light curves. Yeah. And you found that they weren't quite. Uh, can you tell with the Allman observations if the disks are warped in any way that might? sort of account for some blocking of light along the line of sight. Um, I don't know, I'm not expecting maybe to be tens of percent like you said, but anything to uh, explain other than the two different disks in different orientations, because that seemed a little odd to me. Yeah, no, actually there is evidence for um, another uh, planetary system or a disk system, um, not this one, but and not a dipper system, where there is uh, evidence for, um, based on shadowing of the disk, um, the inner disk, how the inner disk shadows the outer disk, that there is an inclined inner disk with respect to the outer disk. So that's uh, an extreme form of warping. Um, and it's not clear what the relationship between the inner disk and outer disk is, because the inner disk might be actually in it at a um, sort of fraction of an AU, whereas what we're probing out here is sort of the 50 to 200 AU uh, dimension. Uh, so we already have, well, the community already has evidence for this. How pervasive that disk is, that inclined disk is, I think we need more information. That's why we want to go after these high resolution observations and scattered light to sort of get in closer. But I, I personally was very skeptical of this inclined disk thing at first, but uh, it seems to be real. All right, so I got a question, K2. Finally, we're finding transiting planets around very young stars, young to very young. And you showed that even accounting for sensitivity, we're probably finding an excess of big planets, right? Um, possible. Right, possible. Okay. So you said that could just be that we're seeing the gravitational contraction, but the time scale doesn't quite work because that should happen sooner than, for example, the large planets in price scale. What about? Evaporation. Is it possible that these are planets that actually did contract, but then at that stronger radiation, then on a time scale of 100 million years, it's not contraction, but we're actually just seeing the evaporation, and that leaves behind the rock and ice cores that we now observe with the old stars from Right. So it's, that's clearly a possibility, and these different red curves actually correspond to different efficiencies of evaporative loss. So you, there's a scaling factor, a dimensional scaling factor, where you take the irradiance at high energies and translate that into escape rates. And this is super efficient, probably not realistic, and this is, these are lower efficiencies, and this is no, no escape at all. So clearly you can get some very spectacular decreases over time. Uh, the time scale, uh, except for the very largest you know, radii of planets, the time scale is still out here, you know, a couple hundred million years for the largest. But this is just one model for a specific set of conditions, so I wouldn't try to keep a yes or no on this mechanism based on just this. It just may mean the models have to be adjusted, presumably. They're good at that. They'll, they'll make it work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Eric. Thank you.